Uh, coming to uh, listen to me tonight. I'm very happy to be with you all. Um, and uh, I also would like to thank uh, to my friends from Art Space and uh, Australia Art Council and uh, uh, also Asia Link uh, that made my trip possible. Uh, you see a short documentary of Gezi Resistance that happened uh, in Istanbul this summer. And it has been still continuing, not this intense, but uh, daily. And maybe you heard about the uh, government ban Twitter. It's still off in Turkey. But uh, uh, the citizens, people gather around. And uh, after uh, the government banned uh, uh, Twitter, that night, only that night, more than 800,000 tweets were sent uh, against the government protesting. Uh, as Alexei mentioned, uh, you have a little idea what had happened and what has been happening in Turkey. And uh, we were, uh, we uh, organized the Biennale, kind of uh, passing through the eye of the storm. And uh, for us, it wasn't easy because including the whole biennial team, and uh, the foundation. We were also in the park. We were also on the street. And, uh, uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, although this biennial is conceived and the conceptual framework was written even one year before uh, 2012 in July, uh, it is very much overlapping with the questions the Biennale posed, uh, uh, with the uh, Biennale post. Uh, the questions are in the center of Gezi resistance, uh, which uh, triggered by the plans of the government to convert uh, the park in the uh, center of the city, Gezi Park, to a shopping center in the form of Ottoman military barracks. And for that reason, people were uh, gathered signatures and uh, petitions and so forth. Uh, in May, more than one uh, 120,000 signatures were collected. But uh, the government and the authorities, instead of listening to the voices in the street, they prefer uh, to close their ears and uh, make it a, a severer conflict. And when the events uh, uh, exploded, uh, they still uh, didn't respond to it but instead repressed violently the voices of its own citizens. Um, actually, uh, Mom and My Barbarian was the title of the exhibition, and I borrowed it from a Turkish poet, woman poet, Lale Müldür. Uh, uh, when we just uh, uh, look at the title, Actually, it's a question, and it's a question to a woman, to a mother. So it foregrounds 
uh, the issues of women. And uh, when you think about the barbarian, uh, it goes right back to the pagan times, when women are considered uh, having uh, magical powers. So they have a prominent place uh, in the society. So, uh, but it's not only that, uh, it comes from, for me, uh, it brings two things together, barbarian. Uh, first, uh, uh, when you look at the linguistic etymology of the uh, word, it uh, is coming from ancient Greek, uh, uh, and uh, they call uh, people uh, who is language they don't understand. It comes from a phonetic background. Uh, when they hear a language that they don't know, it sounds like in English, blah, 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 or bar, bar, bar. So they call the people uh, who is language they don't know or they don't understand. They call the people bar, bar, who cannot speak Greek language or Greek language properly. So it is about languages that we don't know. It's about the language of the most excluded or repressed. But more than that, it also combines the issues that I want to raise in the exhibition, which is about citizenship. And uh, 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 if you cannot speak the language, Greek language, then uh, you are a barbarian. Thus, you are not considered as citizens. So uh, two things it combines the unorthodox languages, and uh, non-citizens. So uh, for me, the barbarian uh, refers to many things, uh, uh, like non-citizens, most repressed, most excluded. But at the same time, uh, it refers to maybe the uh, languages of the ones who dare to change the system, who dare to apart the scenes of the system, to show you the otherwise, the possibility of otherwise. Today, uh, we all know that there is a big discontent uh, about the governances, and there is a demand for another world. But we also know that the existing formulas, the existing theory, or existing languages fall short to call a new world, for, fall short to call or define uh, a new world to come. So we need to, uh, in order to imagine a new world, we need to understand the languages of the other, so we need to learn the other languages. But more than that, we need to invent new languages that can define a new world to come. So very basically, the artistic side uh, of my conceptual framework uh, uh, comes from poetry and uh, uh, refers to language issue and citizenship issue. Um, actually, the conceptual framework I, under this title, I constructed in three lines. Theoretical line is uh, the question uh, based on the notion of public domain as a political public forum. So it can be um, it's, a, it's a question how multiple publics can come together, live together, and act collectively. Of course, uh, these questions uh, uh, was a probability for me when I was thinking uh, and writing the conceptual framework. But with Gizi, uh, the utopic, although shortly, you know, maybe 15 days, the park and Taksim was occupied by thousands of people. And uh, it became a kind of uh, reality. It transferred to the realm of experience. We all experienced that, yes, multiple publics, uh, different worlds, even the contrasting ones, can come together, act together. Instead of a polarized uh, world, uh, the agonistic uh, public domain is possible, we saw it. Um, so this was the theoretical line, and as the praxis side of the theory, 
I uh, choose the urban public spaces and especially the most contested sites, uh, contested uh, districts in Istanbul under urban transformation. However, uh, after Gezi happened, it was uh, a big question for us. Uh, there, were, there were to be 14 projects in the urban public spaces. Taksim Square, Gezi Park, uh, Tarlabaşı Boulevard, Karaköy, and uh, all these areas are really very contested and very uh, problematic uh, situations. However, when Gezi has happened, we begin to discuss what does it mean to realize these projects in urban public spaces. Uh, there is two points uh, about that. One of them is a public domain is, we cannot talk about a public domain anymore because it is, uh, it is uh, uh, occupied by police forces. So it's not a free space. And uh, secondly, uh, that if we realize art projects with, uh, in the public domain, we have to collaborate with city authorities. And city authorities uh, during Gezi and after Gezi uh, really uh, uh, behaved uh, uh, in an agoraphobic manner. They cut off the public transport, for instance. So you see a, a ship, a boat, but uh, during uh, Gezi period, they cut it off. For that reason, people walk from the bridge to come to Taksim Square. They, uh, during the Gezi, the night uh, uh, the uh, police attack and it was evacuated, the uh, city authorities even cut off the electricity. Uh, and there were children, there were really old people in the park, uh, so that the police is able to evacuate the space. So, uh, and uh, in the protest, eight people, very young people, died. So, the city authorities have blood in their hands. It's not simply a, a conflict or a simply a contrast between us. And uh, if you make city uh, 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 urban uh, projects uh, collaborating with the city, then in a way, uh, you clean the uh, blood in their hands through art. You instrumentalize art for the publicity of the authorities that uh, they need very badly after Gezi Park. And uh, besides, for me, any project, of course I am borrowing it from Chantal Mouf, any project uh, realized uh, the raison d'etre of any project realized in the urban public spaces is to open up the conflict, maybe add more conflict to make it visible and debatable. The conflict split open with Gezi. And if we put the art projects in the urban public domain, it would have even covered the existing conflict uh, again. We made two uh, forums in urban uh, neighborhood parks because after Gezi, people gathered in the neighborhood parks to continue, make forums. We make two forums open to public, anyone, and invite activists, artists, everyone, and discuss this topic, what should we do? We want, should we continue or should we withdraw? Of course, there were uh, other uh, opinions that uh, you should continue to do it because we should reclaim the public domain, even uh, guerrilla type of projects. Of course, it's, it, it is a bit naive because Biennale is a big organization. You don't do it in two days. And uh, all the projects have been, we have been working for two years. And secondly, I am uh, kind of against uh, doing that guerrilla type of projects with the invited artists all over the world because uh, uh, you can go to the protest and risk your life or can be in the custody, but you cannot ask it from an artist uh, to do it, uh, coming from, for instance, Australia or something. But besides, for me, 
Aktivizm and art has a relationship, yes. They can learn from each other. They can exchange ideas. But for me, they are in different realms. Art is in the realm of symbolic, and it can transform you in a different way. And it may not produce immediate answers to the political questions, but rather give uh, uh, individuals uh, opportunity to think about the issues. Uh, they, uh, artworks can open a kind of utopic moments in our daily routines to remind us that it can be otherwise, but uh, it cannot really uh, change the system in one minute or uh, the, it cannot produce activist uh, type of reactions. So from the beginning, I didn't invite any uh, guerrilla type of uh, guerrilla type of organizations to involve in the exhibition because also it is unfair to them because they are reacting against all the institutional frames and to put them in the institutional frame uh, you domesticate them and you reduce their impact. So I never ever uh, before the Gezi or after the Gezi uh, intend to invite uh, activists to create guerrilla type of... Anyway, uh, so uh, we decided talking with the artists, all, uh, not all, but artists, activists and everyone, we drove from the urban public spaces and to continue the discussion around these issues in the exhibition sites. And uh, together with that, from the beginning, we wanted to make the Biennale free of charge. But of course, there are budgets, there are problems. Istanbul Biennial has a very limited budget and uh, multiple uh, sponsors. And there is almost no, not no, but I think uh, up to 5% of the total budget support from government. So there, uh, there was uh, budgetary problems that we couldn't do the Biennale free of charge totally, but only one day. Um, a week we could do it, but after our decision to withdraw from the urban public spaces, uh, we, uh, we made a campaign and thanks to the sponsors, uh, we could make it free of charge. And uh, because uh, maybe people have habit to, after Gezi, come together around culture and art, it was visited intensely. It was the most visited exhibition till now in Turkey. Uh, 300,037 uh, 3, uh, uh, people uh, visited the exhibition in five weeks. And uh, it was uh, um, kind of, uh, although we withdraw from the urban public spaces, the exhibition sites became public space that people gather around. So after this short introduction uh, about the concept and what has happened, uh, I have to tell you very, very shortly also this, with our decision to withdraw from the urban public spaces, we had many, many complications, including for instance, since I declare that we won't collaborate with the urban authorities, of course, urban authorities responded to us. Um, Biennale has an uh, ongoing agreement with the municipality for the billboards in the city. Of course, they refused to give it uh, with this uh, situation. But not only that, there were 14 projects in the public domain already, we had to, in almost a bit more than a month, we have to talk with all the artists. Some of them came with beautiful, wonderful projects, uh, which can uh, be in the indoors. Some of them, like Tadashi Kawamata, he said, yeah, but we can show the drawings of my plan so that people have an idea. Uh, and some of them disappeared, so sadly. So uh, uh, we had many complications, and among them, uh, venues. 
uh, when we withdrew, <laughs> we had a problem of venues. But thanks to the institutions, uh, we can collaborate with uh, SALT and ARTER, and also an artist-initiated uh, space. So uh, in a month, we reshuffle everything, and we rethought all the plan and uh, uh, the relations and the relation of the venues with each other and so forth, and uh, was able to realize the exhibition. So in the exhibition, I will give you a fast tour about that. But uh, before that, uh, also, uh, I will give away a, a bit of my curatorial agenda while I was uh, 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 considering the exhibition. I try to encore the exhibition uh, in time spatially. So uh, what I uh, uh, thought is that like uh, Benjamin's angel approaching the future without losing the sight of the past can be a method. So I uh, crack open a historical uh, uh, aperture between now and 60s and 70s. But uh, it was a conscious uh, uh, point to 60s and 70s. Uh, and the common denominate, denominator between these two periods are uh, both periods uh, people are looking for, asking for, demanding for another world. But more than that, uh, New York, Amsterdam, Paris, uh, all of them were under urban transformation in the 70s. And artists like Gordon Matta Clark, or Neely Alter, or uh, they all develop uh, novel practices against gentrification and urban transformation. So uh, I crack open a historical aperture between today and uh, 60s, 70s, in order to uh, have a perspective uh, on social change, urban transformation, and artistic practices on that. Geographically speaking, when we think about art in public space, actually uh, USA, Britain, or Northern Europe, the artists from Northern Europe, has more experience and education on this field as a social welfare state is supporting public art. However, when we look what is really burning problematic today in the cities or in the urban public spaces, it is not the northern hemisphere, hemisphere but south, it's not the west, but the east, you know. So I focus on uh, artists from the southern hemisphere, from Mexico, uh, Brazil, Peru, or uh, East uh, India, uh, Middle East, uh, North Africa, Egypt, or Turkey. Uh, uh, out of 88 artists and collective, 50 uh, artists and collective are from Southern Hemisphere and uh, also from the East part of the world. So, and uh, poetry and music played a big role in the selection of the work, also in structuring the works in the exhibition site. I'll tell a bit. Okay. Uh, the Antrepo, uh, uh, the Antrepos are the traditional site of the Biennale, and it has been used for the last 15 years for the Biennale. However, they got their share from the uh, unbridled urban transformation. And now this entrepot is used for art for the last time. Because uh, just after Biennale, it will be uh, converted to a five-star hotel or a shopping center and so forth. So in order to have a reference to that, Ayşe Erkman, Turkish artist, uh, she created a sculptural uh, intervention 
with a huge crane and a, a demolishing wall, uh, hitting to the wall of Antrepa, uh, which reminds a ticking bomb for the city, for for whole city. And uh, then we enter the Antrepa. Uh, the first thing you come across is the uh, a castle uh, piece installation by Jorge Mendes Blake. Um, it is a 22 meter long uh, wall. And if you look uh, at the center, there's an undulation. And if you look closer, you see in the foundation, there is the book by Kafka, the castle. Um, kind of a structuring element, but also this destabilizing element. And I, uh, I, co co I planned the Antrepo together with the Biennale uh, architect, Duygu, Duygu Doğan, uh, reflecting the conceptual framework. So we created three squares in the Antrepo and some avenues and side streets. And uh, the first square you will see yes, the first square uh, reserved for the artistic practices which uh, really concentrated on space and living practices, collective living practices and uh, uh, artistic gestures uh, for uh, improving them. Um, in the middle of the square, like Kabe in Islam, uh, we had Fernanda Gomez from Brazil. She uh, created uh, a space um, the, through her relation with the place. She stayed in Istanbul 20 days. Uh, every day she is going to cafes or some uh, wooden workshops or very uh, unrelated places and she bring her relation uh, with those spaces and make uh, installation inside of the room to open up the uh, all of our senses uh, to perceive uh, pure space and our relationship with it. Even crackers are there, or uh, cigarette uh, paper, burnt cigarette paper. Uh, and these uh, wooden balls are from a wooden workshop near to the venue. Uh, even uh, there were grapes, because she was eating grapes <laughs> at lunch. And so uh, it, it begins from an abstracted situation with uh, our pure uh, experience with space and uh, it was going into more uh, detail related to space, related to cities and situations. Uh, Christoph Schaefer, uh, he's an artist from Hamburg and he's uh, also one of the members of Right to the City movement and uh, he has uh, very beautiful drawings like visual narrations uh, of the situation. And uh, um, she came, he came to Istanbul uh, four times uh, before Gezi and just after Gezi. And uh, he narrated his experience of Istanbul uh, through his uh, drawings. And uh, uh, it, is, uh, it start from the Nika riots that he did in February, February 2013, uh, which is the, one of the most violent uh, uh, uprisings during the Byzantine time. And uh, he went to, uh, you see, uh, the Bostans, uh, very historic Bostans that people uh, cultivate uh, vegetables inside of the city from Ottoman times onwards. Uh, they are also right now under urban transformation. And uh, he was uh, very much in contact with me and with the activists in the city. 
uh, and during the evacuation, 16th of June, uh, the park was evacuated very violently. That night, uh, together with his friends, he was in Hamburg, maybe after a couple of beer, they decided to change the name of uh, Park Fiction, which is, uh, uh, which is a gain from their resistance in 1990s, while the Hamburg uh, port uh, harbor was transformed. Uh, through their resistance with the neighborhood, they bite a good piece for park uh, in the neighborhood. And that park was called Park Fiction, and it was shown in documenta, I think, 1998 or something like that. And that night they, they decided to do it, and next day uh, hundreds of people gathered and they take a photograph and you see the drawing of him, Gezi Park Fiction, and now it's called Gezi. And this is uh, this drawing I adore because after uh, the Gezi resistance, I told you people gather in the neighborhood parks to have forums, but uh, I don't know if you know the religious feast, Islamic religious feast, Ramadan. It's a month of feasting and then you have a dinner. And uh, uh, in the Gezi Park, actually, there were also Muslim people, uh, uh, anti-capitalist Muslims or revolutionary Muslims. They uh, begin to organize uh, uh, dinners on the floors and including myself and everyone, atheist or feminist or uh, environmentalist, uh, hundreds uh, kilometers of uh, tables on the streets uh, organized. Everyone brings some food and share it. Uh, uh, and uh, for a month, we had that dinners in Istanbul and he uh, joined some of them and he made a, a drawing of it. And what is really exciting about this is even having dinner together can be a method for a protest. I cannot go through each work uh, because there are hundreds, hun hundred, more than hundred work. But uh, I want to show you the video of Halil Altındere, Wonderland. It was produced in February 2013, much earlier than Gizi, but uh, it is expressing the anger and frustration of the people of Sulukule neighborhood. Sulukule neighborhood is the oldest settlement of Roma people in the world, and they have been living there, but it became the first urban transformation site. In 2006, uh, they planned to uh, demolish the neighborhood and transport the people 35 kilometers out of the city center. And uh, Roma people earned their life with music in the uh, restaurants and also um, street vendors there, so they couldn't survive 35 kilometers away. Out of 300 families, only two families stayed in the places and the others come back to city, but they don't have the space anymore because the neighborhood has already transformed into luxury uh, villas. And uh, uh, in 2007, actually, some grassroots organizations, Sulukule Platform, together with Chamber of Architects, Chamber of City Planners and uh, Grassroots, uh, they opened a court case uh, against the plans of demolition. And 2012, in February, the court decided, no, you cannot demolish this neighborhood because it's a heritage. But by then, it has already been demolished and new villas are even sold to the new owners. So uh, government behaved like a mafia. They didn't even wait for the court decision. So this uh, video I want to show you.
kapımıza dayandılar Mahallemizi yıkmaya geldiler Bugün sulu kule, yarın balat, ok meydanı, tarlabaşı, gezi parkı Vakit daraldı Fakirden alıp zengine verir oldular Gece kondu yıkıp rezidans yaptılar Sanat ve müzik silahınız ola Tahribadı isyan durdurun bu yıkımı hadi ola <gülüyor> I know it uh, is very violent to see a police put in fire and we uh, I have to tell you that the boys who is rapping there are uh, from Sulukule they were born there they are Roma they are coming from Roma background they born there they raised there and they made this song before the artist met them when artist meet meet them, he was very impressed and uh, said, should we make a film, a video in the form of a video clip? And uh, we discussed a lot about this burning situation because for me it's violent and so forth. Of course, it's a hip hop and in hip hop there is a tradition of that. But the artist and the kids, three kids, they said, yeah, but uh, the neighborhood kids also wants this. So it's a part of uh, the expression of the neighborhood kids. And these uh, rappers uh, uh, learned how to make hip hop in, a, uh, in the school that Sulukule platform, a, a, a collective a grassroots organization with, by artists, musicians, they develop a school for the kids because they are uh, working with uh, the, uh, traditionally with music to give them to empower them in one way uh, and uh, uh, for that reason we thought yes this is the expression of the neighborhood and if we cut it it's a censorship so we want to show the anger and since it is done before uh, Gezi it gives you the feeling of the people living in the city. So anyway, uh, very fast I have to go, I guess. Um, and Toki is the main actor, government organization, working uh, public-private funds to, for the urban transformation. So Toki is a kind of target for uh, many people. But in the exhibition, we had many uh, examples of uh, from uh, Israel to Peru to Lima. Um, for instance, Eddie Hirose, he is from Peru, but he uh, had beautiful photographs. Um, I also just want to uh, give you an example because this is a very violent and very a uh, strong reaction, but uh, in the exhibition I try to put works uh, in different shades, from very minor, very subtle, very small gestures to very violent ones like you saw. Uh, this work uh, is by Fernando Ortega, he's from Mexico. Uh, and uh, this work is called Music for a Small Boat Crossing a Medium-Sized River. It consists of eight photographs and one uh, uh, letters, two letters and one uh, DVD, music DVD. And uh, uh, there is a river between two small villages, Bobos River. It's a medium-sized river, as he put it. 
and uh, uh, there is a boat, small ferry, uh, carrying people from one side to another. And the ferry driver uh, always plays the music, but since it is less than a minute, the travel, it takes less than a minute, always the music cut half or short. So Fernando Ortega wrote to Brian Eno asking him to make a music for uh, uh, the boat, and he accepted it. Uh, the letter shows uh, uh, his letter to him and uh, Brian Eno's answer, and uh, you see the DVD. In the exhibition, we don't listen to the music because uh, the only place you can listen to the music is Bobos River, that small ferry. But I also show this because uh, in the exhibition, poetry and music has a prominent place. Uh, of course, I have many references to literature, poetry, works referring to that, but uh, the documentation of small interventions like this uh, is also related to the grammar of poetry. For instance, here, uh, yes, you see uh, a river and uh, the boat. You don't need eight photographs to show it. It's not the documentation of it. But eight photographs, like the verses in poetry, rhymes. And it, uh, rather than giving you a solid documentation of the intervention, it gives you a poetic version uh, through the visuality. So there were really uh, uh, small gestures in the exhibition. For instance, uh, Ito Barada from uh, Tunisia, uh, she called her work Ba Heste. Ba Heste means fine gesture, but usually useless. So she kind of refers to the artistic uh, practice as a fine but useless gesture. Uh, so also I am telling this because it also shows my approach to the activist work and artwork. Uh, Uh, also, Cadu from Brazil, he withdrew to the mountains of Rio and uh, lived there almost a year. And uh, uh, for me, it is very important. If you don't have the answer, uh, you don't have to act. You can withdraw, you can retreat to think. So this gesture is also showing a different way of reacting uh, the world. Um, the second square, uh, you see the, uh, the wall behind, uh, is reserved for practices, mostly historic practices. But in the middle of it, we have the House of Natural Fiber from Indonesia, a collective of 13 people. And what they did is uh, create a kind of uh, in between a technological model and a sculpture, uh, giving, uh, transferring the vibration of the plants uh, to an analog system so that uh, 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 you see the vibration of it uh, uh, on this sculptural entity. And also they arrange a kind of a, a sound so that you hear them too. So for me, it's the most unorthodox language that we even don't think that they have a voice. Um, but also in the uh, square, we have Gordon Matta Clark. And uh, uh, I, I prefer to show his work, uh, The Canonical Intersect, uh, from 1975. He did it for uh, Ninth Paris Biennale. And this place, two buildings, he made these beautiful uh, cuttings and splittings uh, next to the Boburg uh, Pompidou construction site. So it's also giving reference that 
Art can cause gentrification too. And uh, next to him, uh, there, were, uh, there was Latoya Ruby Fraser, uh, a black feminist uh, artist from US now. And uh, uh, we have the Brodock series. She was born in Brodock and raised in Brodock, and it, it is under urban transformation. And this is the hospital there. Since it wasn't making profit, the hospital was uh, demolished. And uh, this is her grandmother uh, in that hospital. And this is herself with uh, her uh, grandpa's pajamas in their house before it is demolished. So it is uh, two different practices. One is very recent, the other is from historical. Both are giving uh, signs. Also, uh, Neil Yalter and Judy Bloom, they created a kind of uh, collage, a fanzine, of 20 uh, districts of Paris in uh, 1974. Two strangers, two women, two strangers looking at the city from their own point of view. But uh, I, I don't remember which district, but when they are talking about Mon, uh, Montmartre, uh, they also uh, have the photos, drawings, stitch on the textile writings. They call Bobourg area, Pompidou, a big hall of culture. So uh, art has the agency of bringing institutional critic to itself to, uh, uh, from 70s even onwards. This is also from uh, 70s from Netherlands, Amsterdam. Artists, designers, all of them come together uh, in a very humorous way to create posters against uh, urban transformation, but against the living consumerist living style uh, pushed on citizens. Bao Heste, this is by Ito Barada. Lots of uh, works related to gentrification in different layers. And I just wanted to uh, talk very shortly about Guyan Bells a suspect. He did it in 1980, uh, and uh, it has two rooms. In the first room, uh, there was the findings of the police uh, after the search of the artist's studio. Uh, and in the second room, you see a kind of reconstruction that uh, the uh, police made a search. And uh, I don't know if you can read it, but uh, uh, I told uh, barbarian as the uh, most unorthodox, and uh, the, this shows the perception uh, of the artist by the society, because uh, they so-called uh, complain the police uh, because of these reasons. The reasons include uh, uh, a smoke too much and come to uh, home very late at night, probably drunk. He was seen with uh, in a left hand, a left uh, leftist demonstrations on TV, or uh, he spent too much time in the parks and uh, bookstores. So <laughs> this also shows uh, uh, the perception, and there are works related to. Uh, the value uh, and uh, Claire Pentecost created, maybe you saw it also in Documenta, uh, 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 money uh, through money and gold through earth. Um, ah, okay. And uh, uh, of course, uh, like here, uh, there were protests. Uh, in Istanbul against the Biennale. Uh, we made the first press conference in January 2013, and the first protest happened there uh, against uh, our main sponsor, because among many other branches, they, uh, they produced military cars. 
And uh, actually, I learned this from the protesters. So uh, afterwards, uh, people ask me, ah, did you accept it if you knew it before? I said, yes, I would accept it for sure. Because art, I have a full trust in art. Um, art's capacity, agency of criticizing or bringing out these burning issues from within the system. And I feel obliged to uh, share this information with all the artists because they have all rights to do it. Then I share this information, talk with the artist, and Hito Styrel was one of the artists. And she has, if you know her practice before, she has also a work related to uh, art and military. Uh, and she came up with a wonderful project related to this issue. She made a lecture performance at the opening time, but also a film of that lecture performance, bringing uh, together the art, uh, art institution's relation with power. So she is asking, is museum a battlefield? And she starts from historical examples, and uh, it's very convoluted uh, presentation, and it's very witty at the same time. Uh, her friend, Andrea, uh, has been, was killed in uh, the uh, uh, North Iraq, between North Iraq and Turkish border. And uh, in the search of what happened to her, because her body couldn't found, uh, no, her body is found, but what happened never uh, known. Uh, she went to north of Iraq and uh, the possible uh, grave, a, a mass grave, and there she found a, a bullet case. And then when she looked at the bullet case, she read General Dynamics, a company in U.S. And she made a film, anyway, about uh, this situation. And she was showing that film in Chicago Museum. And then she realized that the, uh, the, one of the executives of the General Dynamics is also in the board of Chicago Art Institute. So she started with the uh, story and combined it with Istanbul case and uh, questions those. So instead of, uh, uh, instead of uh, thinking to cancel the exhibition, I, because it's a platform, you can voice this, you can talk about this. But if you cancel it, there is no platform. And it's an international platform. Not only locally uh, we deal with the issues, but we can do it all together. So you can see Koch our main sponsor. And our main sponsor is very interesting. Uh, didn't react uh, uh, nervously. Instead, uh, they just, OK, this is your exhibition. So there are many beautiful projects related to poetry and visual. And, but uh, I, we don't have time. So I'm going a bit fast. OK. Uh, the third square was reserved for projects in art in public domain. And specifically, looking at the uh, 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 unscripted uh, actions in public domain. So I also invited uh, some artists, uh, uh, historic artists from 70s, like Jiri Kovanda or Academia Ruku, or Mirla Laderman Ukeles. And uh, one of the uh, uh, performance he did, I'm sure you know his performances, very, very subtle, very poetic. And uh, this is called theater. And uh, what he does is just standing in front of uh, the National Museum. And uh, uh, this also gives a, a backdrop for the performance done on the 17th of uh, June in Istanbul is a day of protesting 
after Gezi was evacuated. He just stand in the middle of the square doing nothing. But you see his shirt is coming up because police try to also uh, uh, interfere with him. There were many performances, uh, ongoing performative projects in the exhibition. And uh, uh, in the square, I have Gathering of Strangers by Nathan Colley uh, with every color, like symbolizing multiple publics. And uh, uh, people come together uh, for a purpose, act collectively. But uh, at the same time, uh, this is uh, a pro project by uh, a Mexican artist again. It's called Lamento. And uh, it was aimed for a public space, a giant sculpture of this, uh, a kind of lamenting to the urban transformation in Guadalamara, Guadalajara. I don't know if I can do it. But uh, in order to raise funds for it, he made smaller copies to sell to the collectors. But after some time, he thought that I shouldn't do this sculpture because it will add to the ugly piles in the city. <laughs> One more thing. So uh, this uh, Lamento, uh, this small, tiny man is lamenting uh, in every city, <laughs> it, it is shown. So in the middle of the square, we had huge uh, uh, timeline of uh, uh, timeline of uh, Thomas Hirschhorn talking about his public domain works. There are really good projects, but we don't have time. Santiago Sierra conceptual monument. Uh, he was uh, invited to a, a competition for uh, uh, for Leipzig to make a, a monument, but instead of uh, proposing a formal piece, he made a kind of manifesto. I don't know if you can read it, but in the manifesto, uh, he is telling that uh, the uh, the the square has to left to the authority of the people. There is no authority except the people. Uh, second, uh, the budget is 6.5 million euro. This money has to uh, given to the public. They should decide uh, what to do. And third, uh, all these monuments or art in public domain has also a problem because with that pretext or excuse, city authorities create urban regeneration or uh, transformation. So it sh they shouldn't touch the square in that sense. But uh, there are many points he created. So I asked him, uh, when I learned it, I asked him, can we do it in Taksim Square? So he was to uh, adapt it to the Taksim Square, and we were to have it in a Taksim Square. But uh, when we withdraw, he made a different version of it. Uh, and this is one of the projects that at the Taksim Square, the Atatürk Cultural Center, you see, uh, don't give in. Uh, this is a very also complicated issue. They want to break it down and make a, a like Sydney, opera house. They said opera house. And then they changed their mind. They said, we want to make a mosque. And then they changed their mind. They said that we want to make a shopping center. But since people reacted very violently, they couldn't do it. And then they said, OK, we are renovating it. And we never get answer from the government till uh, July something. Uh, they uh, didn't say yes or no. Whenever we go and we said we want to have a light uh, project there, and the light project was called intensive care. And it was like Macintosh, breathing. The building was breathing, but with some crisis. Uh, and you don't know if it will live or die. So the artists were able to make a small application of it to the exhibition site to give the audience a bit taste of what could it be. 
it became like this afterwards, <laughs> uh, this uh, Atatürk Cultural Center. Mirle Laderman Ukeles, we have a very good selection of her major works, uh, maintenance works. Also, she was juxtaposed with a uh, Egyptian female artist, Amal Kenevi. She made a public performance on the streets of Cairo before the, uh, before the uprising there. Uh, she hired 12 day laborers to walk on force in the main street. Uh, and she, she, uh, they were led by her. And uh, of course, it uh, split open the conflict and there were discussions on the street and they were taken to uh, custody and they stayed two nights in the police station. But yes, I think I need to uh, stop here. Maybe I can stop with the Australian artist, <laughs> yes, Nicolas Mangan. Uh, Nicolas Mangan's work, I, I'm sure you know, uh, very, very poetic work, and uh, it's called uh, A World Undone. Uh, he uh, made a video of the uh, earth material, uh, the oldest earth material, uh, found in uh, uh, Australia, and uh, 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 this is the, what you see is the cosmic dust almost. And when you watch it, you don't know if you are watching a meteoroid uh, shower. Uh, um, his work I put at the end of the exhibition because it's bringing earth and celestial or earth and uh, cosmic together. You have the experience of both. Uh, this is only one venue. We have four more venues, but uh, maybe next time I'll continue. Thank you so much. Uh